Good morning. My name is Courtney Talbot and welcome to our webinar today focused on change management. Before we get started, I want to go through a few logistics. So today's webinar is a Teams live event. Attendees are muted, so you can interact via the Q&A. Uh, Michael Dupree is on and he is our moderator and will um, either be responding to the questions or he'll directly bring them into the Q&A window and we'll um, address them. We also have a Q&A section at the end of the webinar to answer everything at that time. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube within the next few days. You will receive an email link of the recording and an opportunity to provide feedback so we can continue to bring um, great content to you in the future. All right, so let's begin with change management in action. Um, everybody goes through change in one way or another, and over the last couple years, we've seen an acceleration in um, of di digital transformation. So with this acceleration has created a renewed sensitivity to employee engagement and retention. I think we're all experiencing a little bit of, um, you know, people changing positions and things around that nature. Um, so with if you've rolled out new technology within you know, the past couple of years or during the pandemic, um, it's not too late to de develop a um, change management plan. And we're going to cover that today. So I am going to change the slide here. Um, here's a little bit about us. My name is Courtney Talbot, as I mentioned, and I'm the VP of Service Delivery of Apex. Um, my goal is really around making sure that we're focusing on our clients' experience and um, achieving their end goals. Joining me today is Ashley Agler. She is our change management practitioner here at Apex, and I'm going to hand it over to Ashley to introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. All right, um, Ashley Agler. I um, am the change management practitioner, as Courtney mentioned, with Apex Digital Solutions. And um, just like Courtney said about being focused on the customer and our delivery, I really focus on what uh, your end users are experiencing um, when you engage with us in a migration or a change effort um, project. So really focused on how do we provide people throughout your organization the best experience possible and um, ensuring that they get the right information at the right time. So glad to be here, Courtney. Excited to do this. All right. Um, so let's get started. Um, the what and why of communications and learning. Um, and Ashley, your experience, why is this so important? Uh, so really understanding the what and why of um, communications and learning is, is getting clarity on how we're speaking to the people that we're essentially changing things for. So understanding um, what it is that we're changing, understanding the why of why we're changing it. Maybe it's um, more of a mandatory change. Or, or maybe it's it's a change for a benefit to the organization. So maybe it's an upgrade of a tool. And what does that intrinsically mean to the person that things are being changed around? Great. You know, from my perspective, a lot of times, you know, I've project manager by nature. Um, you know, that's where I've focused or have started in the IT industry. So, you know, a great deal, my experience, you know, a great deal of times the technology changes starts with the IT department, right? From releasing security updates to implementing new software. Um, you know, those are the changes, you know, the IT team's the ones that are bringing that forward. And, um, you know, when implementing change, most of the time, you know, we're trying to make sure that they have the least amount of impact to the organization. But, we're really focused on the organization as a whole and not necessarily how, you know, what end users are experiencing. So, you know, common pitfalls I see is like 
did we communicate the go live date? Usually it's last minute communication, right? Sent out to the week before the staff of the changes coming. Um, you know, includes the downtime, you know, that they won't be able to work over the weekend, but doesn't really, you know, not what to expect on a broader scale. The other thing is, was learning, did we conduct learning? And, you know, a lot of the times when we're even focused on doing projects, and I'm working with a technical team, we're thinking of product updates or product features that they're going to gain, but not necessarily how they're going to use their um, the tool effectively and how it's going to affect people with their jobs. You know, there are so many things to consider, um, you know, more, more things to consider when implementing change. And, you know, Ashley, what is your experience um, with users when they hear a change is coming? When people hear changes are coming, it, it's a lot. But it, it cues a lot different feeling inside of someone to start hearing about a new tool because that's where we um, get into a person. Like we start thinking, like, is this going to benefit my job or my role? How is it going to change my job and my role? Is this something that you know? you know, maybe intrinsically someone gets a little bit scared or concerned. It's a new tool. It's something that um, maybe isn't in their job description. So that's a big change of how they're going to be doing everything day to day, even with an MFA, for instance, so a multi-factor authentication process, you have uh, changed from the ground up how someone accesses their information every single day. So that goes into the thought of, you know, am I going am I going to be able to do my job? Am I going to have to, you know, invest more time in this or am I going to be completely rethinking how I work? And a lot of times when we are sending out those communications, something we tend to forget is you know, the important things about the change. So what what is important to the end user that sometimes IT forgets in the message. So we almost get so focused when we're in the mode of creating these change management messages. Of we need to tell people the day, the learning, and then, um, you know, other mandatory information that they'll need to know, but we forget in our wording and, and how we're sharing that message that there's a person on the other end reading it and things that may be important to them um, are things that IT get leaves behind or leaves on the table. I couldn't agree more. Um, I can tell you, you know, from practice and methodology, from an overall project perspective, we're primarily focused on the end goals, you know, meeting the deliverables, not necessarily how it impacts the users on an individual basis. And, you know, from a project manager, the success Your call of has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging project, system. Um, four, two, five, four, sorry. two, <laughs> two. Um, sorry about that. Something came through my head. Um, so, you know, project success is managed really on the scale of delivering on time, on budget, and with the least amount of impact to the end users. That's what my I've been trained in and out for project management. How does this differ from a change management? So, when I'm delivering from that change management perspective, I'm I'm concerned about what are we doing from understanding what's possible with the tools so you know what different opportunities will people have to potentially work more efficiently and and that's where we get into brainstorming the possible so what's possible with the tools we have and then from a or organization perspective if we're going to be switching to new tools is it going to require us to potentially work differently or use our data in a different way. So how are we going to communicate that new way of working and strategy? And then finally, with our last topic of today is, you know, how does the impact of the change 
you know, how is that going to change someone's day-to-day task? What are they, you know, what are they going to experience and feel and how can we make it easier for them to adapt that? So really leading into building out your learning and readiness plans so people feel included, they feel informed, and they feel prepared for the change versus um, kind of being left in the dark. Does that, that help, Courtney? It does, absolutely. So I think we should start with, at first, you know, understanding the possible. Definitely. So with understanding the possible, um, we'll let you, Courtney, um, talk a little bit about, you know, how the change is improving um, how people are working. Yeah, so, you know, it always helps to, for them to understand um, when implementing change, thinking about um, not only about the change, but what's going to be occurring, you know, what what's improving um you know looking at their um is it bringing in things that are working new ways um how do people understand change right trying to build that desire of what's in it for them why they need to change and you know if you look at microsoft teams for an example you know you can go ahead and say okay we're just implementing calling or we're just going to implement ca collaboration but as soon as you start to roll that out and people see other things it's it's hard to contain as well as um you know they're gonna there it is gonna change the way they're looking they're they're working today you know that if they were on skype or if they're using some other direct routing tool you know you're, you've got everything in one platform from their calling if you know they're going to be able to collaborate, you know, before they may be emailing files around and you're going to switch them from doing that to having all their communication really within one platform. So understanding that and understanding what that looks like from the end user perspective, it might, it will, for my, for me, it definitely inc improves the anxiety that the end users are experiencing. So would you say by really mapping these things out um, from that project manager perspective, it gives you clarity and, and maybe some comfort that you know exactly how someone, like the other end or the expectation of the change? Yeah, so from a project manager's perspective and where I've been trying to take an, an approach um, as we are going through and doing implementations here at Apex is really trying to get a better understanding of that, what what bringing that aspect to the project, right? Looking at things and saying, okay, e you know, even when you mentioned multi-factor, we can talk about that a little later, but understanding how that's gonna impact the end user, um, you know, IT may think, oh, it's just simple. It's just like your banking and things around that nature. But, you know, some people we find out, you know, they, they don't have a, a top notch phone, right? They, they, they're they still running off of flip phones or things like that. So understanding how it's going to impact the end user and understanding that I think will help drive your project and, and even to a new level of success. Definitely. Sounds like people people will then be a little more on board and especially if you've done the surveys and, and the footwork up front of understanding, you know, for instance, like you said, a, a flip phone for MFA may not be the best tool to have. So um, really getting a good understanding of your end users so then that way you can meet them where they're at. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that we've done, you know, is really using business ca use cases to try to help understand this. So, Ashley, wh why don't we kind of walk through this template and how you've used this in the um, through some of your change management? Definitely. So this is a very powerful tool that we've been using um, to essentially build out a business use case. So a business use case is a essentially setting the expectation for a person looking to do something using a specific tool. So when we look at this um, in the first line here that says as someone in, 
that would be someone either in a department or um, more of a defined work group. Maybe they're, you know, they want to, for instance, start to manage their um, process, their people, technology in a different way. So if we want to play, play example here, Courtney, we could say, you know, as someone in sales and marketing, I want to better understand how to activate my new, my clients, how to reach out to my clients and, and manage that relationship in a, in a better way. And finally, if we come down here and we start to, the, really the last point should be talking about the technology because once we understand how to map the, the person, what they're trying to do, then we can finally say, you know, with the technology or with their new CRM, you would be able to, you know, use that new CRM to log in, look at your individuals and, um, you know, manage those relationships and, and send out messages as needed. And then finally, what's the most important part here is success should really be written in the eyes of the person that's trying to do this task or this new business use case. So writing out your success would be, I know this is successful when I can accomplish the task within the new CRM of checking my people and, and sending out my messages and staying in contact um, with those those folks that I need to continually um, interact with. That's a great example. I can remember, you know, contacts through business cards and a Rolodex. And so, you know, being able to map that out of what people are experiencing and relate it back to how that you want them to use the new CRM tool um, would be a great option to help them maybe lessen the lessen the, the change or lighten the load a little bit so that they're not so worried about what's to come. Yeah, and, and it's really setting it's setting the expectation of I I know that I, I need to do this task and I understand the expectation of what success looks like very clearly defined versus um, sometimes what we see with IT is hey you've got to use this new tool here's how you log in and then there's really no context built to give the user the with them or what's in it for me um one of my favorite favorite lines from a movie is from charlotte's web when templeton the the mouse you know they go and ask him for help and he just turns around he's like what's in it for me All right because you know i see folks were coming in and saying you know, we're going to implement this, but we forget that that person still has the keys of being the one to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think building that what's in it for me um, definitely helps um, drive things forward, right? Because we're, we're a creature of habit. <laughs> so, you know, unless, unless I know what the impact of that is going to be long term, yeah, I, I might be a lagger. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so um, we're going to add this business case use case, um, this business use case example in here into the slide deck. So um, you'll have this, you know, to possibly use as you guys um, go forward with building out those use cases when you're going through change. Um, so the other piece of it is ex accounting for the complexity. Um, Definitely, you know, appreciating the complexity of things. Um, everything sometimes seems really simple. It's just it's just this little change, you know, no no big deal here. Um, but really looking at it from a change perspective is exactly what we were talking about earlier, right? Understanding the aspects of change and how it impacts the user. Um, you know, building good business cases for change. You know, the other part of it is learning. So, you know, once we've got the change perspective, right, we understand how it's going to impact the user and things like that. What do you do, um, Ashley, from a learning perspective when you're building that readiness plan? 
So great, great question there, Courtney. And I, I think when we start to look to our learning and communication plans, that's where we start to look at not only those business use cases of what we can do with the new tool and the power of, of what we're ushering in with that change, but also who who has to learn about the new tool um, what is it going to do to impact their role or everyday um, interactions throughout their job? And then how can we communicate that learning, that support, and the change in a way that is positive and that brings people along and people have the understanding of, of what it is that um, they need to be learning? That's great. I'm going to go, you know, looking at that support piece, you know, as we mentioned, a lot of times it's it's the IT department that is initiating change, but understanding that they're not alone in this effort, right? They're not the one man band. Uh, they're, you, yeah. There's a lot of people that are in the organization that can help support and drive this change. Um, things that I, I've experienced, you know, just when we're looking at people, you know, really starting to bring in HR and, and, you know, employee engagement, making sure that they're a part of the conversation early on. Um, so it doesn't just have to be on the all, whole IT department. Um, yeah. Ashley, where, where have yeah, you found success? It, it, that's definitely a really good point there, Courtney, with, um, you know, it doesn't have you as the IT, so I know we may have some IT professionals and we may have professionals in, in different parts of an organization. It doesn't always have to be all about the IT department supporting the change. One thing that I like to look for is individuals within your organization that are those natural influencers who, you know, these are people with social currency. So what social currency means is they're seen in good light. They may not have to be a leader, but there's someone that everyone turns to because they somehow get the tool quickly or they get the change quickly. They're personable, they're really kind. And um, not only that, but then also looking at bringing in people that are willing to help activate this sort of a support structure where you essentially have your community people the people that are, um, you know, always the helping, lending a hand coworker. So setting the expectation for the change of, hey, these are the people to go ask help from. And then moving up this ladder from into maybe the champions that have a little bit more training, a little bit more ability to triage uh, that assistance. Maybe it's pointing someone back over to the learning versus that just having that technical and that expert level person being the one carrying all the way. Yeah, I think th I think finding your natural influencers, um, the ones that you mentioned with the social currency um, within the org is is huge to to help build that because if they see, you know, them doing it or, you know, it, it's a little bit more eager than maybe if they, you didn't have that, right? If you didn't have those natural influences kind of helping lead the way. Um, you know, also I find, you know, we talked about HR, it, getting an executive sponsor, um, sometimes having that come out, you know, being on board early is also helpful. Um, and again, explaining why why they need the, the, why we're doing the change, you know, so it's not just something that we've decided to, roll out at the last minute. Definitely. So that's really getting the briefing kit, your briefing kit and and all of your core messaging around the change out to those people early. So then they can continue to repeat the message. And it goes, uh, at, you know, um, there's like those commercials where the people are singing the phone number over and over, the power of seven. So if we can get something in front of someone seven times, if we can repeat that message seven times, it starts to become a concrete, um, you know, it, it becomes more concrete for them versus 
the one and done email message that we may have sent out before. Absolutely. Um, it going forward with a readiness plan. So, you know, there's on stage, off stage activities, um, the people side of it, and then the technical side of it. All of that should be considered when driving change and um, with the implementation. I can tell you one time um, I was debriefing with a colleague about they had done a multi factor authentication project and it just didn't go the way they wanted it to go. And, you know, we were kind of just discussing just how we could have improved the process. And so what they did, you know, we went through and we were like, OK, did did you do a pilot? Yep, we piloted um, about five people in the organization. Pilot went smooth. And then they went ahead and rolled it out the multi factor out to the rest of the organization. They sent out communication via email, a couple how to documents about, you know, loading up the multi factor application on their phone. Um, when they went to go through implementation, it just crashed. It actually um, shut the business down and they had to roll it back. And when we started breaking it down, we found out that the pilot group was, you know, their early adopters, but their early adopters all were in within one department. So that department was their high tech department, early adopters. Nobody else in the organization tried to see what it would look like from their perspective. Um, another thing when they sent out the communication, you know, they sent it out right before they did the implementation. So maybe they sent the communication out on a Tuesday. They turned it on on a Thursday or Friday. So that was the other thing people didn't have time to. They were in their busy season, so people didn't have time to read the communication, um, get the application installed on their phone. There was no checks and balances to let people know that this was happening. And then the last thing that we found out that happened is they did the train. They did the um, switch on a Friday. I think they had a lot of people out of the office and when they went to check and do things over the weekend, it, they couldn't access it because of the communication and you know <laughs> things around that nature. So it, it ended up being quite catastrophic to the organization um, that their executive team members weren't on board, so they didn't know that this was going on and might have, I think they were traveling at the time. Um, so we, we talked about all the different things that could have changed or, or you know how we could have made this better and um one of them would be creating this readiness plan uh, you know ashley if we had something like this in place how do you think that would have went or how we could have done that better um well it sounds like it, there was a, a lot of missing communication um in general from from the just like looking at the moral of the story that you just shared you know we're, we were missing a lot of different modalities of communication. So just sending that email um, is a red flag to me to say, you know, well, um, I know a lot of people nowadays hardly ever check their email. So, you know, maybe maybe we could have done a few things differently in terms of the frequency of the communication and, and also um, ensuring that timing of, of their training activities and their support activities is, is really well mapped out. So individuals know, um, you know, is there training, is there training and, and knowledge transfer happening several t different times before the actual go live event? And, and is there still opportunities afterwards? Because we have laggers, we have people that it, it's, you hear about the change, you know the change is coming, you deny the change to yourself until it actually happens. And then you're like, oh no, I, oh no, this thing happened. I've been told seven times and now here it is. I have to go to a training. So having a structure like a readiness plan essentially lets you outline your timeline, your communications, your learning pathways, your support plan, you have a good understanding of where technical things are happening, as well as building out a champion network. So by getting that briefing and a, a um, briefing kit out with your champion network in the early stages, in that awareness phase, they can then 
continually repeat that message. So you have almost three weeks of messaging leading up to your go live versus just, hey, you know, seven days, we're going to go turn this tool on. And, and now you all have to use multi-factor authentication, which means hopefully you have the right device to move forward with your daily work. So having this sort of a plan really gives you a clear roadmap of what's happening on stage, off stage, as well as what can the user expect through the journey. I think that is a great idea. When we were going back through and in talking about it, you know, when when she had told me that they had only sent it out via email, I was I, I love the idea of having multiple modes of communication, right? I, I think, you know, covering it in weekly team meetings, having it come from, you know, executive sponsors, that really will help. And, and I know that a lot of times it's, you know, multi-factor people are thinking, well, it's just an app on their phone or so, something they don't necessarily need training, but even just the follow-up like, hey, have you gotten, the, have you downloaded the app yet? You know, this is coming or just those yeah. extra touch points or, you know, or even referring back to it as, you know, like you do for your banking, right? A lot of other, um, platforms right now do have multi-factor authentication turned on. So being able to provide it in a relatable context um, would have been helpful. Luckily, they were ended up being able to work through their project, but you know, it's always good to go back and, and break something apart and figure out where, you know, they could have made some changes. And I think at the time the person was very like, you know, this th we did all the steps and I was like, oh, but there's so much more. And so seeing something like this in a readiness plan, um, you know, in, in, in looking at it and going, wow, if we're going to implement this, we really should start the communication, you know, T minus 20 days. And I, I like the countdown that it provides and definitely the reinforcement after because yeah, when you mentioned your email about waiting till the last minute and then something going in and going, oh wait, I got something on that. I I, I may have been guilty once or twice about that in the past. So <laughs> that was very helpful. I was like, oh yeah, I've, I've done that. So. Yeah, yeah. And we, I mean, we all are, you know, we get to maybe a month end or we get to a point where a tool like this is, is very valuable in, in providing that repeated message repeated and you know by the end of the change I, I have been told you know we heard about the change so much we knew it was coming well before the go live date and it's like perfect like I know my you know I know that my job is done here and and you guys were aware of it because you know once someone's like oh my gosh I've heard about it when is it happening then you've built the desire, you've you've communicated it enough that they're like, okay, let's get this thing over with. Let's move on with life um, rather than trying to hide from it and stick, stick your head in the sand, really. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to talk a little bit about personas and why that matters um, when you're looking at change management. So Ashley is going to talk you through um, a little bit about this um, from a couple different aspects of your business. Definitely. This one's exciting. So personas are really understanding the different core roles or functions of your business and starting to map essentially giving the core functions or or people kind of groups, some different titles so that you can essentially start to build your learning and your communication around these core groups. So for this activity, we're going to imagine that, you know, if we've got three different work groups at our organization, you know, we have our leadership, but then we have our admin assistants. And these are people supporting leadership. So if you can imagine, they're not only managing their own day, but they're managing someone else's day and they have to be quick on their service. They have to be able to, at the drop of a hat, access information. They have to be able to share those things and how someone else can work um, efficiently. So they're really working against time constraints. They're trying to 
manage two people's day. And then you have your back office professionals, you know, think of this as someone doing finance work. They like to sit and do analysis and forecasting, which is critical to ensure that your business is performing well and making money. And they typically have more time for their tasks because they're, they're really digging. They're doing like, um, finder finder work whereas you know your back your salespeople and your travel people they have to understand how to be very communicative and um how to be very mobile with their tools so we have three very different people from a communication and learning perspective because we wouldn't talk to these three people in the same way or we wouldn't present learning to them in this all in the same way because they don't have the same time throughout their day to get on board and and you know maybe sit through a very long training yeah so when you're starting to think about those p three personas and and the questions one thing that stands out to me right like how will the learning time impact these people and i can imagine like your direct sales like the, they, they probably need something on the fly, right? Like they're, they're very busy. So I'm thinking like even like having an LMS or, or something that provides, you know, Microsoft Diva um, or Viva, um, you know, something that provides you quick videos or something like that, as opposed to pulling them out and sending them in an hour long training session. Yeah, definitely. Because that hour long training session may cost them sales calls, whereas if you are encouraging them through that learning management system or some on-demand learning through Viva, it's as they need it. So, you know, maybe they want to learn how to use Teams on their phone. They could maybe watch a five minute video versus sitting in on a training. And same can be said for that admin assistant. Maybe they, they're constantly following someone's schedule and they they want to get better at the tools, but it's only five to 20 minutes a day that they can really invest into learning. Well, and I know even with that ad admin assistant, right? Like their features and functions are gonna be completely different than what's required from either of the other two. So having them sit in a training um, for the, the basic stuff but they're gonna they're gonna need so much extra too because they're they're managing like you said two people's schedules so you know another one you know what features and functions are of the change are more important i i can see them being able to manage not only their calendar but their the people that they support's calendar as well where your sales staff or your um back office aren't going to need those as much yeah, it, it could be that they need that, you know, they need that moderator or that sort of um, guest access into someone's calendar. And, you know, how is that going to impact? They have a completely different way of being impacted by the change because they're now managing two versus one. So how, how can we map all of these different um, mutate, like kind of mutations or submutations of, of, ways of working to meet other people, you know, meet, meet them where they're at versus trying to shotgun a training and show them absolutely everything the tool, tool can do, which can feel very overwhelming. So in a recap, like, what do you think are the, you know, things that we want to make sure that we consider when you're looking at personas? So if I had to recap this, Courtney, um, what I what I would say is caution here is is keep your personas easy for people to identify with. So if you are thinking of people in your organization, use terms, use language that makes sense to them, and then um, also reach out to other parts of your business because. Once you start to talk to maybe you're someone in IT, you go to HR or you're in HR, you're conducting a change, you go to IT, people may have already mapped personas that you can work together to um, kind of shift for your change. And then the other thing is, is really important is talking to your leadership 
to have them really buy in on, on this new tool and how you're approaching any new change in your organization. Because if you have that leadership buy-in and their willingness and ability to um, go forward with this, it will make it so much easier when you actually take your readiness plan and you take all that learning and communication and start to publish it out because then someone can't back, you know, like back channel back up to leadership and say, I don't like this or this isn't working for me because leadership already had, like they're with you, they're working with you, they're in lockstep with you. And if someone did have a really valid um, concern or a uh, response to how this change is being rolled out, leadership can maybe mitigate it or have a really open, transparent conversation with the project team and, and with this person to say, you know, how can we do it better versus, you know, potentially undermining all the work that you just put forth. Oh, I like that idea. That is great. Um, you know, what are some things that you want to make sure we include in the breakdowns? You know, when you're when you're starting to map out what those personas look like. Yeah, the, um, it, you know, one thing that we want to include is, for instance, all the stuff in this list is a really great starting point for your personas. I'm not going to go through and name read this all off, but it's really around getting to the core understanding of what's the expectation that you're going to be setting on the persona from that timing, time management, um, so that you can let them know in your communications, once you know how much time is going to be expected for their learning, you can start to communicate early, hey, you're going to be expected to spend anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes learning this new tool, and also understanding their preferred communication methods is a great way to reach someone where they're at versus you saying, oh, I do everything, I send these communication emails. So if you have the ability to maybe send SMS or, um, you know, get into those le like weekly team meetings, maybe that's how someone receives their information about the organization over kind of what's now somewhat of a tool that people use for just tracking and, and CYA effort of, of using the email inbox. Well, great. I'm glad you started mentioning communication because we've gone through, you know, the, the readiness plan, our use cases, um, you know, building personas, and now down to the nitty gritty of getting ready and personal with communications. So, I know my experience, you know, with, you know, some communications and, and things around that nature. It's it's really explaining why the communication is occurring, you know, going through the ad car process. Um, you know, Ashley, you covered that in our last webinar, but really, you know, understanding that and getting that out there of why the change is occurring and how it affects them. Um, you know, if you're writing it per a persona, you know, making your, sure you're considering the people that you're talking to. Um, yeah. I would make sure that you're not using, you know, time relevant things. I know one thing, you know, so if you're saying multi-factor, you know, not MFA or, you know, so those types of things And my personal thing that I like to do is if instead of sending out a huge long email with the details of what you need at the bottom, I like to make sure that that's up top. So if I need them to attend a training or I have a question on something or anything like that, that's the first thing I ask and then try to filter in the rest of the details more so that they at least stand out because I find my experience is that people don't always make it to the end of the email, they get interrupted or things like that. So if there's something I really need them to know, I would make sure that that's on top. Definitely. And uh, other things you can do too is any, I know we, we say leave the technical jargon and, and abbreviations for IT. This really goes for any change. If, if, if it's a HR change or a, you know, IT change, or maybe it's people, people change. 
clearly defining what it is that these new terms mean, because we live in a world now where it seems like every two hours there's a new acronym or there's a new abbreviation of something coming out. Giving people a common dictionary of what you're talking about throughout your change process in your writing will help them understand clearly what you're trying to accomplish over, you know, using the language that maybe feels familiar to you. It happens so frequently and and I see it all the time is, you know, we get in enveloped in these projects and we get deep into, you know, hey, did you use the MSA and this token and that and that? And before you know it, you're talking in a code that maybe your coworkers have no clue what you even just said. So by building the common dictionary in your organization, you can write a much clearer communication and use those common common themes or common words and even redefine them throughout your communication so someone's aware of, of what you're really trying to get at. Oh, that, that is an excellent point. I, I have also two teenagers, so between the, you know, the common acronyms and then the text acronyms that they like to put forward, half the time I don't even know what they're t- trying to tell me. So <laughs> I think having that common dictionary of those terms is very, very helpful. Um, yeah, definitely. We like to have commonality is, is how we can we can build understanding throughout an, an organization. So in terms of learning, so when we are talking about learning, we are a lot of pitfalls we run into are, you know, we're not setting expectations in our learning pathway. So we come in and we're like, hey, we need to train you to do this tool. But we didn't say what it is that the expectation is. It's just we need to train you to do this versus the expectation is that you can log in, you can check your client, like your clientele and your, your, your contacts and you can contact them versus saying, okay, I know that um, the expectation is you need to check your things. Now, with that expectation being set, you should do this learning. So when you're considering how to set your learning up and talk about it, make sure that you're very clear on those two points. Once again, using ADCAR really sets the stage of how someone's going to go through that learning journey and what they're going to be able to take away from it. And also, how are you setting up your training? Who are you writing to in that training? So depending on the roles and what's going to change, how can you play off of that so that your um, training is coming off in a way that speaks to the persona? And finally, just making sure that you're being really timely and relevant with your training. It would be a shame to essentially, when we look at our readiness plan, do your training at 21 days before the change because most users are going to forget everything you showed them. So coming in right before the change and right after the change to reinforce that learning gives you several opportunities for someone to get prepared beforehand and also review after the fact to feel um, supported and and ready afterwards. So I was going to say, I find that that's very true, Ashley. And and really, it's, you know, the day, I hate to like, you know, people have a lot of things going on, but having that training a day or two before the implementation so that they're well aware of what's, what's happening and then also having it after that implementation so that they have the tool that you've implemented and if they have any questions, you know, even if they attended the training before, having that option for a training after is helpful so that if they do, now that they have it, they they can, you know, attend again if they want or, um, you know, to ask questions or you, as you mentioned earlier, those laggers for people that, you know, forgot that change was going to come and now they're like, oh, I got this. I, I need to attend to find out what what's going on. Yeah. All right. 
Great. Um, building in flexibility, you know, change is not linear. It, it, it's all over. I'll let you talk about it, but it's, it's a little bit more. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more than just, you know. So I, I like to think, yeah, I like to think of change is, is almost when you really look at um, the emotions and, and what happens to someone, everyone sees their internal and external world differently. Um, it takes some people can get excited about a change and jump on board and, and they're ready versus someone else that maybe their natural instinctive change is fear. So fears of the unknown, fears of, of what's going to happen. So really when we move through change a lot of times it's almost like a spiral because we come around and we're like okay I'm so excited and I'm doing really well and then oh oh no like this is new again maybe they take a few steps back and then they come back to the to that kind of breaking point where they're like okay I'll put my toes back in the water again okay it's safe so then they move a little bit forward a little little further so it's really important to understand your company culture and how your company embraces change. So are you a company that's coming at it from a growth mindset and it's exciting and you try to make it fun versus a fixed mindset where people are very much, this is how I do my job. This is how I survive. I do not like get out of this lane. Um, a lot of times with that fixed mindset, it's very hard to move very agile through change because you have to keep coming back to remind someone it's okay to move forward. This is what we're embracing as an organization. So it's important to account for what I like to call integration weeks or time for people to really fully process what has happened around them. Yeah, so building an integration weeks, you know, a lot of times, you, you know, you never know what people are going through, right? So it, trying to do a change or something within the organization over summer where there's a lot of people out for vacation or, or travel, um, that's been, you know, we've seen that not work so well. Um, even when you have like, if, you know, quarter end, year end, things around, and then throw in a holiday, like, you know, anything that last month of December, or even when you're, it's your fiscal year, trying to implement a huge change at that time, um, you get some sad little faces, <laughs> little burnout going on. <laughs> you get the little burnout peoples, and yeah, it really an integration week can take your readiness plan, and you can say, okay, you know, we have our T minus 21, but Maybe you build in two weeks of flexibility in there or a week of flexibility based off of maybe you give out some feedback surveys like, you know, how are you feeling about this change? And if someone gives you the sad burnout guy, you're like, okay, let's give them a week or a few days just so that they can sit with the change and they can feel, feel out what they need to move through so that they come out on the other side of that feeling and that kind of goopiness and in, in them give them a little extra time to get through that goopiness and then they're like oh you know this is good this is good for the organization and you can send out encouraging messages using your case for change and your business you know your business use cases you can continually remind them of, of why it's encouraging to move forward to get them through that phase of burnout. Yeah, it all ultimately helping, you know, with that employee engagement and retention too, because if you're, yeah, you've got a bunch of those little sad little faces and burnout, um, that's also not going to help you with the change and moving forward. All right, so yes, that, um, people, oh, will, people will run away very quickly from your org if you keep making them into sad burnout people. Yes, that is not good. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're about, oh, just about time. We're going to open it up for some Q&A. Wanted to let you know that we're going to be doing, you know, change with Microsoft Teams, a panel in March. But um, keep your eyes open for some other webinar events that we're putting out. Um, going to.
there's a way to schedule your assessment. Um, and we'll be sending out the webinar and the slide deck. Um, but is there, Michael, is there any Q questions that you have? Uh, the only thing that uh, had come through um, was uh, Doug asked if we will get a, of the, he can get a copy of the presentation slide deck and uh, just to kind of share with the group um, that anyone who did attend live will get a, um, a copy of the deck. Um, but the, uh, there was a question that we got um, uh, coming uh, in for the registration process that I think uh, is uh, a good question to bring up here uh, is my organization is only 20 people. Are we too small to use change management? Ashley, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I not at all. No organization is is too small to start your change management journey. Um, these tools are very valuable to groups of really any size. Working within a small department, I would say actually um, build you up or, or would make you even more successful in your change management practice because um, you're closer to the people you're working with. And uh, another question that we got in registration was, uh, does every project need change management? Ooh, Courtney, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I think it depends on the assessment. Um, you know, usually anything that has an impact to the way, you know, individuals work, that should be considered for change management. Um, if the efforts no no change, you know you're just doing a simple upgrade. There's no new features or things like that. You could do it without change management. But really, if you're starting to look at the way people are changing or the way people are changing the way they're working, you you know you want to consider some form of change management. Yeah, and I think that uh, that kind of goes nicely into this this last one that I had here was. Uh, this feels like a topic more for HR typically. What should, uh, why should IT also be concerned about change management? Oh, I like this one. So, um, you know, we do a lot of satisfaction surveys in, in IT to make sure we're giving good service. This goes right into your service metrics. So, you know, the more aware you can make users happening, the more willing to take the steps forward to be ready for the change. And ultimately, you know, this leads to more call less leads to less calls for your help desk, less of your resources being pulled away for those hand holding moments, and really more visibility into what's happening with IT. That's all the uh, it's any uh, any and all of the Q and A questions that I had. But if you guys do have any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, and uh, we'll. Be happy to talk more with you guys about it. Thank you. And thanks everyone. Have thanks. a great day.